Climate science is a young science. It may not have answers to all the critical questions. But the biggest impediment to stemming global warming today comes not from any gaps in our scientific understanding of the phenomenon of global warming, but from the increasingly murky geopolitics surrounding the climate change <laughs> subject. Human induced global warming has created a vicious spiral. Human impacts are degrading the natural systems and depleting natural resources and contributing to global warming. And global warming, in turn, is exacerbating impacts, adverse impacts on ecosystems. So we are caught in a vicious circle. The real issue is how do we break this vicious circle? That's the central issue. It is proving quite difficult to develop and enforce international norms against activities that contribute to climate change. The natural systems, including the land, water, marine, and atmospheric resources utilized by the human race should be so managed as to ensure optimum sustainable productivity. Yet, human alterations of natural systems have become so profound that the earth has entered what has been called a new time in a new era in geological time, a new era in geological time, which the Nobel Prize winning chemist Paul Crutzen has described as Anthropocene. Anthropocene in which the human civilization, not nature, is the dominant force transforming natural systems. If we have to preserve our planet, for future generations, we have to move from the Anthropocene era to Sustainocene age, in which all countries and all communities are committed to sustainable development. That is what is at the root of the challenge that we face today. The well-being <coughs> of humans hinges on the natural environment as underscored by the spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria and the coronavirus outbreak. And by human health I mean not just physical health but also social and psychological health as defined by WHO. The natural environment is very important for human health. A study done way back in, in the 80s, published in the Journal of Science in 1984, found that post-operative patients in hospitals who had rooms overlooking trees needed less pain medication and less hospitalization than patients whose rooms looked out at brick walls. We may not be conscious of this, but plants and flowers play an important role in our lives. This underscores the importance of protecting and preserving biodiversity and protecting ecosystems. The human civilization, as you know, is thousands of years old. Yet the greatest damage to natural systems has been wrecked in just the last 100 years. The last 100 years have brought tremendous progress, almost unparalleled progress in human history. But the last 100 years have also brought unparalleled damage to natural systems. Just in the last 100 years, Humans have altered or modified 
75% of all, all land. We have modified the natural flows of two thirds of all rivers. And they have driven one quarter of bird species and many large mammal species to extinction. According to the UN, 85% of all wetlands have been, have, have been lost, they have disappeared. And since the mid 1970s alone, we have lost more than half of all biodiversity of aquatic systems. That has been the extent of damage. And in fact, the damage has accelerated in the post World War II period. Today, if you look at river systems, only 21 rivers, there are thousands of rivers in the world, but only 21 rivers, 21 long rivers, still flow free from their mountain sources to the ocean. All other rivers, the natural flows have been modified through cascades of dams, reservoirs, barrages, levees, and dikes. A recent human study has warned that up to one million plant and animal species face extinction, many within decades. In fact, we're losing species almost daily with important implications for our search for new biologically active compounds. Even large herbivores, herbivores like elephants, rhinos, and hippos are disappearing from our world at a startling rate even though, as vegetarians, they cause no harm to other species. In fact, such large herbivores are crucial for ecosystems. These examples underscore the extent to which human-induced environmental change has occurred. Such environmental change is a stepping stone to climate change. Just land transformation, land transformation through deforestation, through the introduction of intensive irrigation, etc. Just land transformation itself is contributing up to 20% to human induced carbon emissions and more substantially to the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Land transformation is also behind the recurrent wildfires like the type that have battered Australia more recently. Against this background, it's rather unfortunate that when we discuss climate change globally, two things stand out. One is a sharp ideological divide, especially between the left and the right, and the second is the increasing politicization of the subject of climate change. Important players have tagged on to the international agenda their own interests. In fact, the geopolitics can be seen from a series of recent developments, including the American withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is a modest agreement to combat climate change. It's a non-binding agreement and the national commitments under the Paris Agreement are adjustable if need be. It's an agreement with, with no teeth and yet, and its goals are largely aspirational and yet the American withdrawal from the Paris Agreement was a very powerful political statement. Or take the argument of some who believe that Global warming will create winners and losers. Their argument is that global warming will change the relative strategic weight of nations, with those in colder climes gaining and many other countries suffering an erosion of security and status. Apparently spurred by such thinking, some countries appear to be in a race to claim the potentially vast energy and other 
resources of the Arctic by laying territorial claims in the polar region. <coughs> and make no mistake, in an interdependent and interconnected world, there will be no winners from global warming, only losers. The effects of global warming will be universal. And even the weather patterns in the higher latitudes will become more unpredictable with important consequences for agriculture, public health and ecosystems in the higher latitudes. This is underscored by the fact that the two polar regions and the Tibetan plateau are warming three times faster than the rest of the world. As far as the countries in the tropics are concerned, they might suffer more. But several studies have pointed to the fact that global warming would intensify the hydrological cycle and bring increased rainfall in the tropics. The reason is that as temperatures rise, the atmosphere's capacity to hold moisture will also rise because warmer air carries more, more, more moisture. So for every one degree Celsius rise in temperature, the atmosphere's water holding capacity will rise by approximately 7%. So the higher rainfall in the tropics might be a silver lining potentially but this higher precipitation will likely come with other unfavorable trends, including increased evapotranspiration, more variation, more, you know, more, unpredictab more, more unpredictability about river flows, also more frequent and intense droughts, flooding, and hurricanes. So the picture is somewhat blurred in the sense that the tropics might suffer more, there might be more rainfall, but many of the trends don't look very good. Unfortunately, the agenda on climate change has become so politicized that even scientific research at times has sought to be manipulated so as to highlight certain data. You know, there were some scandals which, which created a very bad image for climate science. There was this Glacier Gate scandal of 2009, and then the, in 2010 there was this um, scandal involving the IPCC. The IPCC is the gold standard in, in climate science. They, the IPCC had to apologize and admit that it's claimed in a published report that the mighty glaciers of the Himalayas would very likely disappear by 2035 and maybe even earlier was a claim that was not based on any peer-reviewed scientific research, but on the basis of a magazine interview given by a glaciologist who later said that he had been misquoted by the magazine. To make matters worse, the lead author of the portion of the IPCC report where this claim appeared told a British newspaper that this claim had actually been deliberately inserted in the report to put pressure on leaders in Asia to do something about the accelerated thawing of the Himalayan glaciers. Now these examples are, are, are you know, they, they underscore the dangers of politicizing a subject like global warming which carries important implications for our future. In fact, looking ahead, the effects of global warming could further intensify the politics around this subject. Climate stress, after all, is likely to lead to serious consequences like internal destabilization in some countries. In some cases, there might be even state failure. And, and these effects, in turn, could invite foreign intervention, whether covert or overt. 
In any case, because of the projected higher frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like droughts, flooding and hurricanes, the armed forces of the major powers would increasingly be called upon to deal with natural disasters beyond their national borders. In fact, disaster relief initiatives are integral to U.S. foreign policy and to U.S. defense strategy already. Given the specter of water wars, internal destabilization, state potential state failure, refugee flows, and more frequent and intense extreme weather events, global warming has correctly been called a threat multiplier. In fact, in some ways it could even serve as mother's nature, mother nature's weapon of mass destruction. <coughs> 